Uh, firstly, I just want to say um, welcome to everybody. Um, if it's your uh, first time uh, at one of these webinars, then uh, doubly welcome. I'm really happy to see you. I'm very happy to see everyone who's back who's seen a webinar before. Um, I've done a few of these in the past, had to take a bit of a break for a while uh, due to illness, uh, and it's really good to be back. Um, I'm going to try my level best not to run over with this one. Quite often they go on for about two hours. I'm going to try not to do that to you uh, this time. Uh, try and just concentrate on getting some good information um, across to you um, as quickly as I can. Um, now, whilst I'm actually doing the webinar uh, and whilst I'm painting, I'll try to keep um, one eye on the chat. Um, but it can be a little bit difficult. Um, so if you have any questions as the webinar is, is going along, um, it would probably be a good idea if you can uh, maybe make a note of them, try and remember them. Um, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So um, basically how this is going to run is um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what I'm going to paint for you today, the little study I'm going to demonstrate. Um, and then I'm going to uh, actually paint a couple of little studies uh, for you just to, to demonstrate some stuff about colour. Uh, and then at the end, I'll... Uh, I'll open it up for Bonnet. Um, now, I'm just going to put a couple of messages in the chat because we always have a few problems. A few people have a few problems right at the beginning. Um, as far as I can see, the sound appears to be working fine. Oh, we should be okay. We should be going for about an hour or so. I think I'm going to try to keep it to about an hour today. Um, I'll do my best. I am absolutely terrible at running over with these things, partly because actually, almost entirely, I think because I just enjoy painting so much, and I especially enjoy um, sharing all this stuff too. Um, hopefully, everyone can see okay. Someone's just asking how to refresh the page. I'll just say that. It's nice if I can just try and help everybody to um, to make sure that they can they have the sound and the and the audio before we actually kick off and get started. But obviously, I don't want to hang around too long because then it gets a little bit dull for the people who are actually ready to go. Um, so uh, I'm going to get started now. Uh, hopefully I've I've covered enough uh, in the chat there for people who, who are having some trouble. The sound is working and the, and the video is working. Um, so uh, what, I, what I'm hoping for with this webinar today, the outcome that I'm, I'm hoping that you will get from it, is to understand how to use the modelling factors of form uh, and colour checking um, to find accurate colours um, in order to paint more realistically and therefore more beautifully to paint with more realistic color and hopefully i'm also going to show that color doesn't actually have to be that hard um, for me i uh, um, have been struggling with color for uh, a very long time i mean i've i've been running my blog as many of you will know for about 10 years now and if you look at some of the first posts there one of my biggest problems with color was color and it was for a long time um, and that really changed when Graydon Parish introduced me to Munsell. Um, and um, I kind of ran with that and, and um, I developed some exercises to try and learn for myself um, how colour reacts to light across form. Um, and uh, I'm still learning all the time. I think uh, um, colour is something that you never stop learning about. But I have got to a point now where I understand some basics about colour. Um, I think I've got to a, a point where I can model form reasonably well with colour and that's the stuff I want to get across to you so that you don't have to go through um, the long period uh, that I went through um, of frustration and thrashing about and following bad advice and all that kind of stuff that can happen to us. So I'm just going to try and give you, a, a not it's not a shortcut because you still have to practice with it, um, but just by avoiding all of those dead ends, I hope to be able to get you to a point um, where you can 
um, start to understand color and better and to paint more beautifully because of that. Um, so first I'm going to uh, just go quickly through what I have set up here. Um, <clears throat> the setup is actually extremely important and none of this works if the stuff isn't set up right. Um, so what I have here is I've got what I'm going to paint. I've got a little Clementine. I know you can't quite see it's hiding behind the edge of the frame here. But there's a little Clementine hiding in the shadow box there. And I'm going to be painting a study of that. I'm also going to be painting a study of this cube today. Um, now, this is a drawing board which I have set on my easel. And I generally work like this for when I'm doing studies. Um, it's quite handy because you can, this is just a little piece of canvas pad you know the paper, the paper with a textured canvas nice and cheap this is a Winsor and Newton one you can stick these onto your drawing board and paint as many studies as you like um, and then I've got this little framer thing here which is uh, made out of black foam core and it has a cross in it um, uh, uh, which is just uh, two pieces of thread held on by a blue tack, which just helps with the drawing out. And you can add more, you can subdivide it more if you like. But this is really useful for a couple of reasons. One, because if you're doing an actual painting, it can help you set up the composition and see what you're going to end up with. But it's especially useful for this whole thing is set up for a basic method that I use for judging color, which is all about using these. Now, this is a Munsell chip. This one is, um, it's hard to read without my glasses actually but it's it's a 2.5 yr616 yr stands for yellow red orange we would call it um 2.5 means it's a, towards the slightly the reddish end of orange um the value is six which means it's um a little above the middle of the value range and the chroma is 16. whoa really high chroma that's a really really intense color okay that's at the upper reaches of chroma and what you can you can get with paint you need to get your strongest but brightest paints out to hit colors like this and your mixes need to be very clean um chroma is best thought of as the intensity of the color from gray on one end of the scale to the brightest color that you can get with paint on the other end of the scale and 16 is as high as the Munsell. um notation goes uh, for paint highest that you, of what you can achieve with paint now what i have that i use along with that is this which i call a color checker you've probably seen people using these before um, basically it's just a piece of card with a very small hole in it and then what it means is it's very useful because you can put your little tag against your color checker like this as you can see mine is very well used and has bits of paint all over it and you can cite over whatever object you happen to be looking at like this and use these tags to find out exactly what those colors are. And that's why Munsell is so useful because once I've found a color like this with a tag, um, <clears throat> I know a few really interesting things about it. For one thing, I've matched the color right because it means that if this is the right color and this is actually one of the colors on the Clementine, um, it means that I can just I, I can mix this color, you know, and I can just keep on testing until I get it right. Put little dabs of the color on then and make sure it's right. But also, I know some interesting stuff about it. I know the hue in Munsell terms. So when I check all of the different colors across the surface of something like this cube, for instance, you can see three sides of a cube at once. So there are three main colors that you would need to paint this cube, right? This darker one here, the lightest one at the top. And this one here so if i've match, matched all of those um <clears throat> then i can look and see what relationships there are between those colors and munsell will tell me that and it will tell me for instance that all of these colors will be the same hue they will just change in terms of chroma and value and that's a really useful thing to know um, so by using the little color checker like this i can move it across the front of my subject and i can check the colors and i can mix them before i actually start um, and the other thing that this frame is really useful for, for because it helps me keep my color checker and my little Munsell tag at the same angle to the light as my panel is. And that is absolutely crucial because if I move it that way, if I angle it away from the, the light, the perceived color that I see on that chip is darker. If I angle it towards the light, it's much lighter. So if I'm doing color checking and my hand is wobbling around like this, I'm going to get all kinds of wild results and it's not going to help at all. It's not going to help me paint with more accurate, more beautiful color. This will, okay? 
um, as long as I keep it really, really straight to the same angle to the light as this is, and this helps me do that, um, whilst I'm judging my colours, I'll know that I've got them right. So I've already been looking at this Clementine. Um, it's actually the same Clementine in this painting up here. If you know me from Facebook, you might have seen this painting. I did this yesterday. Uh, this is the same Clementine. I'm going to paint it again today. And I've done some colour checking on this, and I've found that all of the colours that I need, almost all of the colours that I need to paint this Clementine, are on this page. I'm trying to get this so there's not too much reflected light, and you can see it. Of, of the Munsell colour book, the Munsell colour atlas. This is generally known as the Munsell big book. So here, this is all the same hue. These are all 2.5 YR, yellow, orange, to us mere mortals. Um, <clears throat> all the same hue. They change from dark at the bottom to light at the top, obviously, and from grey to higher chroma. Here's what I was talking about, the chroma. And this little chip here actually goes here on this page it's the highest possible chroma orange you can get and if you want to hit that that color orange you need really clean mixes you need a very clean palette and you need your brightest colors and what i use to hit that color is michael harding's cadmium orange and michael harding cadmium yellow together and they're both very high chroma um, and with those i managed to i managed to get to uh, to that color and, and to reach it fairly accurately um, lighting, I'll, I'll talk, if you can, questions like stuff about the lighting, if you can keep that question for the Q&A at the end, um, ask it again then, um, and I'll, I'll ask it again then, and if you can ask it again then, I'll answer questions at the end. It's a little bit difficult whilst I'm in the middle of this um, to keep stopping and answering questions because I've got to look at different stuff on the screen as I'm talking. So I can't always keep up with the chat. And when, I, when I'm painting, it's pretty much impossible, I'm afraid. Um, so hopefully that's, that's given you some idea of why the setup is like this. It's really is all about balancing the light. Now, at the moment, because it's the evening in the UK, I'm working under an artificial light. I'll send out some links in a, a follow-up email to the kind of lights I'm using so you can see what I'm using. But ordinarily, I would be using daylight. Um, usually, I paint in daylight. But at the moment, I've got extremely strong um, daylight bulbs um, so their high CR uh, color rendering index is high um, and they're um, very cool and they're also very strong um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to try and do now I think that's really pretty much what I need to tell you about the setup except perhaps that I've got the palette here as well and you can probably see here I've already mixed up some of the colors so I'm going to paint this cube and I'm going to paint that clementine now, actually, I'll I'll tell you very quickly whilst I've got I'm on this camera is I've done some checking for this cube as well, and obviously for a cube you can only see three sides at once. So in terms of colours that you need to paint this, you really only need three, and there they are. So I've already done some judging, but there's five hit down here, and these ones are for the Clementine, and I'm going to explain why that is now. Let's just have a quick check in the chat. Um, can you tell me just quickly if it looks like some people are having some trouble? Can you tell me just quickly if you can still hear me okay um, and if you can still see me okay if you could just say quickly in the chat if that's still working all right for you it does look like a few people might be having some problem oh it looks like we're okay thank you so much it's quite difficult for me here because i've just got to guess whether you can see me and hear me or not um, and sometimes you see someone have a problem. Thank you so much for the feedback. That's great to hear. Okay, um, we'll keep motoring on. Now I'm going to try something now. Um, let's see if this works. Now I have, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. Um, so if you'd give me just a second, and let's see if I can remember how to do this. Okay. So very shortly, you should be seeing, hopefully, a slide of um, the main modeling factors, what I consider to be the main modeling factors of a sphere. Okay, So if you follow the blog, you will have seen this um, picture uh, on the last blog post that I did, which was about this too. Uh, now, the reason I've only got five modeling factors there is because I've, I'm, I'm only talking about the stuff that's on the surface of the sphere itself. 
Um, for the full range of modeling factors, you would be including the cast shadow, something called the occlusion shadow, which is the, the very darkest bit you get right underneath the sphere there, the very darkest part of the cast shadow, umbra and penumbra and all this kind of stuff. But what I'm interested in here is those five modeling factors, because those are the ones that I need to know the colors for. And if I can get the colors right for those five modeling factors, then um, I'm pretty much guaranteed that as soon as I come to paint something, um, that it's going to come out all right. So we've got <clears throat> the core shadow is the darkest part of the shadow, uh, the reflected light. Um, usually you will have some bounce light coming into the shadow from somewhere. In this photograph, it's coming from um, the surface that the sphere is sitting on and it's bouncing up into the into the shadow. So the bottom part of the shadow on the sphere is lighter. The half tone obviously is somewhere between the darks and the lights. And then for the light area, you really need to be worrying just about two um, main modeling factors, the center light, which is sometimes called um, the highlight. Um, uh, sorry, not the highlight, the form light, uh, the center light, which is the main light area, and then the highlight, which if it's not, it doesn't really show so much on this picture, but if this was a shiny sphere, um, then there would be a, a little um, pinpoint of reflected light in the middle of the center light. Um, and people often paint those white and assume that they're just white, but they generally are the color of the light. Um, so hopefully that will have given you some idea. Let's see if I can turn off this screen share now. Hopefully that worked. Of course, I have no idea if it did or not, but hopefully it did. Um, <clears throat> and you saw that. Actually, here's something. If you could just tell me quickly um, in the chat if you managed to see that, um, that little image of the sphere with the modeling factors, that would be very useful too. Just let me know if you could see that. Um, uh, so those five modeling factors, um, Yes, everyone could see it. Brilliant. I'm so pleased. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so those five modeling fa factors correspond to the five colors that I've got here. So what I've done is using the color checker and my Munsell chips on this Clementine, um, I've checked like this and with the chips, um, all of the various modeling factors because a Clementine after all is almost a sphere. Okay. Um, so the modeling factors basically the same. So if I know that if I get those five the colors for those five modeling factors right that my clementine is going to look okay right so this is part of what i'm talking about um where and this can be a, a quicker way to get you to the correct colors to painting something that looks real and i think in a lot of ways color is i think it it's it's the most important thing to get right in realism um if your colors are badly out nothing you paint is really going to live and i'm including value obviously as part of that um, if your drawing is slightly out, but your colors are good um, and your values are good, then you can still create a feeling of depth and a feeling of form uh, and life. Um, but if your colors are out, it's, it's something probably that you paint probably isn't going to live too much on the canvas at all. You can paint really, really loosely if your colors are right and you will still be able to create form and you can create a beautiful picture. Or you can paint really, really meticulously if your colors are right, it's going to work. Um, but painting meticulously or painting loosely, more so painting loosely, I think, doesn't work at all if your colors aren't right, okay? Um, so <clears throat> by using this little color checker, I've got the main five, hopefully you can see here. Let me just check that this is in the picture, okay? I've got across here, these are the main five colors that I've found for the Clementine, okay? Here is the core shadow. Um, here is the reflected light in the shadow. Here are the half tones. Here's the center light and here's the highlight. There will be something a little bit lighter than that, maybe a little bit of white because it's very shiny um, and I've got a very um, bright light there. So one, two, three, four, five, that should be, those colors should be all I need, right? To paint a Clementine if I'm right. So I'm about to try that for you and we'll see if I'm right, okay? Um, here's the cube. Obviously, we can only see three colors. So I've got one, two, three shadow, the, effectively the half tone um, and the lightest plane. So I ought to be able to paint the cube with just these three. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to paint the cube. And secondly, then I'm going to paint the Clementine um, and we'll see how that comes out. Hopefully really nice, you know, <laughs> if, I've, if I've judged the colors right. Um, so really, 
I just need to make sure that I put them in the right place uh, and that I use the right colors and we should be okay. So what I'm going to try and do now, assuming the technology works all right, is I'm going to change over to the other camera, which is actually on the, the, the study here. It's on the, on the, um, the board here now for the cube. Um, I haven't got the cube. This is the cube. I haven't actually got it in the shadow box because they're so simple. I'm just going to demonstrate really just painting these um, three sides of the cube very flat just so you can see um, if that if the color looks right um, and then I'm going to paint the clementine now for both of these I've already roughed them out and I've painted the background in and the reason I've done that is it means that I can get through everything that I really want to show you um, much quicker in the webinar and I won't get um, involved in just painting the background and having fun for myself without getting <laughs> enough useful information across to you okay so let's see if we can change over to the other camera now, uh, and I'll actually start doing some painting for you. Okay, we should now, you should be able to see the study on the easel there and enough of the palette so that you can see with the, with the colors pre-mixed there so that you can actually see what I'm doing as we go along. I'm just going to take one of those lights off, um, which hopefully will make it a little bit easier to see. So first things first, um, <clears throat> here I've, uh, I've got three brushes, um, which I'm going to be using. Uh, I always paint this way, no matter how... Uh, what I'm painting, I always have one brush for shadows, one for uh, mid-tones and half-tones, and one for lights. And I try, although I don't always succeed, to keep those brushes separate um, because it enables me to still keep cleaner mixes. And that's still going to be very important when I'm actually painting this, this cube and this clementine, especially the clementine, um, because that's the highest chroma. Uh, the clementine is actually slightly higher chroma than the cube. So, as I say, I've already roughed in my, my background here um, and I've put in the cast shadow. Now, in terms of modeling factors, you, would all, you also have here the cast shadow and you can probably just barely see under this edge here is what they call the occlusion shadow. You only get a very small amount of it with a cube. Um, uh, but roughly, what I, I, I generally start a painting in this way. First, I will paint the background, then I paint the ground, then I paint the cast shadow, um, then I finish off the edges a little bit. Um, this one is obviously is fairly roughly finished because it's just a shadow and then the next bit I do is go in and paint the shadow So let's take one of these brushes uh, If you want to know which brushes I'm using These are Rosemary's brushes. You can look up on Google um, And these are the long mongoose filberts size 3 And I always have three the same size uh, so that for whatever I'm painting, I can uh, I can swap from one to the other. So let's get them. We get the shadow part of the cube in first. I generally try to paint shadows reasonably thinly. Because I think it helps when you uh, uh, when you come to paint the lights. If you paint the lights more thickly, it helps with that kind of illusion of form. By no means do you have to do that. Lots of people don't paint that way, but I, I find it a nice way to create a feeling, a bit more of an illusion of 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 the physicality of the form. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm just going to bang this in fairly quickly. So that should be something like the right color for the shadow plane of my cube. Pretty dark, right? You might, it's probably if you went in and painted something like that without <clears throat> checking it first, you wouldn't paint it that dark. So what is effectively the half tones? Because the light on this cube is more over here than down here. Um, this plane, the top plane of the cube, is slightly darker, and this front plane is the lightest plane of the cube. Um, so I'm going to get another brush out. 
the medium I've got here is Marage medium old masters Marage medium actually I'm, this is I think this is the last bit that I've got my tube is almost empty and I'll paint just pop in the top plane So interesting, I always think at this stage, when you're painting, I mean, this obviously is just the cube, it's very simple. But when you're painting real world objects, when you get to this stage, you should always, you should already have a, a feeling of the light and the physicality of the form. And if you haven't, there's probably something wrong when you do them in this quite methodical way, you know, working from the background to the cast shadow to the shadow plane up. Another brush and I'll paint the front plane now. Go on a bit more thickly with this. Now, this might not seem like the most inspiring thing to be painting, but I tell you something, I love painting these cube studies because you can learn so much so quickly about color. They're much easier to figure out what colors you need for, um, partly because there's only three, and partly because they have large flat areas. So the color checker method works really well with them. It's really, it's really simple. Or it's oh, well, really simple is perhaps an exaggeration. It's it's easier. It's considerably easier to get close to the colours that you see um, with the, with the checking method. I should mention that that actually takes some practice to do as well. Um, you get better at it with time. It's like colour mixing. Um, I'm going to do a webinar, I think, just on colour mixing. I was going to do some stuff about how I mix the colours in this one. But then I realized the webinar was going to hopelessly overrun if I did that, because color mixing takes some time, especially if you've got a few to do. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to switch back to my... mid-value brush and then just fill that in a little bit. There. So that's basically my cube, right? Um, so I don't need to look at the cube itself to paint that. I'm pretty sure that those colors are something like about right. I would say the shadow side, it, it's, now it's on there. I've actually, I've tried to use a different color than I normally use for this. I've used transparent red oxide. Um, and I think it's, it's a bit too orangey. Um, so let's see if I can't, with a bit of burnt umber, because it's gone on very transparent and underneath is white. The hue is looking a bit too orange to me. So let's see if I can mix up. What I'm doing now is I'm mixing a similar value color, but slightly more yellow in hue by using burnt umber and um, cadmium yellow. And then I'm bringing a bit of transparent red oxide back in. That certainly looks a bit closer to me in hue terms. You never know when things can catch you out. A bit caught out there by that tube paint because it was a little bit too transparent. Okay, so there's a fairly reasonable, and but very simple painting of a cube. I'm gonna swap back to the main camera for a second now. And I'm going to move back over again. So that I can talk to you. Um, so hopefully um, that's shown you reasonably clearly um, how I've gone about getting pretty close to the colours. In fact, probably very close to the colours that uh, I would need to paint this little cube accurately. Um, and this cube, it can be 
uh, it's not exactly the same hue as the clementine. The cube is slightly more yellowish in terms of hue. But if they were exactly the same hue, and you can do that, I could ma ma uh, mix exactly the um, the local color of the clementine and then paint this cube with it. It would act as a kind of a cipher, as a way in for me to find the colors. Also a very useful thing to do if you're struggling with um, getting the colors of something. Say it's a lemon or something like that, something yellow that um, people do quite often struggle with from what I hear. You can uh, get a cube, paint it the same local color as the lemon, um, and then color check and do a painting of the cube. It's going to be simpler and it's going to um, show you um, how you what what tube paints you're going to need to use to mix the, sh the shadow colors of a lemon and get it right. So that was fairly simple, right? I only needed three colors for that one. What are my palette? Someone's asking what are my palette colors for mixing. Now we'll talk a little bit about that now, um, <clears throat> actually, because it's it's relevant to what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah. now. Because I needed to keep really high chroma for these colors, this one is a chroma 14 and it's very bright. All I've got here is, uh, in terms of what I've used um, to mix these colors, is cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, transparent red oxide, which I'm kind of experimenting with in my yellow mixes at the moment and uh, I might stop experimenting with it because I'm not sure it worked out too well there and burnt umber um, the last time I did a painting like this with high chroma orange a high chroma orange object I, a yellow orange it was it was a rose I just used cadmium yellow cadmium orange and burnt umber and that was all I used um, <clears throat> the neutrals and the black and white that I've got across the top of the palette there are just for painting the background I haven't put them in the mi in the mixes at all um, because it's been really important that I keep chrome as high as possible. Uh, and in fact, let me just show you uh, this page um, from the Monsell book again, because the colours of the Clementine pretty much describe a curve around the outside. So at each of these values, um, I need the highest chroma that I can possibly get in this hue. Um, so the centre light for the Clementine is right around here, you know. Um, the highlight is over here, um, the half tone is here, and the shadow uh, the um, the shadow side, the reflected light in the shadow is there, and the shadow is there. So I've got to get the highest chroma that I possibly can in all those mixes. So if they get at all dirty, I'm going to struggle. So I'm using the highest chroma paints that I've got to get them. Um, so I'm going to take that one down now. That was really just, I wanted to show you a simplified version. Uh, of what I'm about to do now on the Clementine. How are we doing for time? About half an hour. Okay, hopefully, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try really hard not to spend too long on this. This is when it gets difficult for me, because I'm actually going to be painting something, and it starts to get much more interesting, and I, this is where I tend to run over. So feel free to say, and tell me in the chat. So stop painting now, it's time for Q&A. You can tell me, and I'll... Uh, and I'll try and remember to stop if I check the chat. <laughs> Hopefully I'm only going to work for about 15, 20 minutes on this. I really just want to show you um, getting the colours in and how it, how it shows the form. Unfortunately, I can't, because I want you to see the palette in this webinar, I, I, can't, have, I can't show you the actual subject as well, um, which is a bit of a shame. Perhaps I'll figure out other way that I can do that uh, in another webinar um, but I would need to pull the camera back further and I like it to be close on the on the panel so you can see what I'm doing I'm going to move uh, switch back to the other camera now hopefully you can see enough of the palette there with the colors at the bottom and the panel too So I'm going to use basically the same approach as I did on the last one, on the cube. So I'm going to get put in my shadow, my core shadow first. 
And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to put these colors in. I'm going to put them in very blocky. And hopefully, if these colors are right, the form of this little clementine should start to appear, despite the fact that I've done very little painting in terms of blending and modeling and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll start with the, the darkest parts of the cast shadow, of the, uh, the core shadow, sorry. And it's up around here. It's very low value. In Munsell terms, it's down to about value two. It's almost as low. In fact, it is as low uh, as the background. And there's always, I find, on, sp on spherical objects, down this edge here, against the cast shadow, there's a darker bit. So I'll put that in. So. That's my core shadow, roughly the shape of my, of my core shadow. So I'm going to use my mid values brush next. I'm going to paint in the reflected light. Again, there's bounce light coming back up off the surface here, back up into, um, into the shadow. Um, and this is the color of the reflected light. It's slightly lighter in value and it's slightly higher chroma. You may need to bring that up. One of the things that you find a lot um, is that reflected lights, people often paint reflected lights in shadow a much higher value than they really are. It's easy to confuse chroma and value, I find. If you look at the paintings of people who paint in what I think of as the Leffel School, um, they punch up the chroma uh, of the reflected lights an awful lot, and it's beautiful, but they get the values right. Um, whereas what beginner painters often do is get the value. They see the reflected light and they concentrate on it, on it and it looks so beautiful and they want to do a good job of it. So they bring it up to light in value and it, it doesn't work so well. So here's my half tone. So there's some around here. Most of the, the colors I have here in hue terms are actually slightly more towards a reddish orange. than they actually are on the on the Clementine. But the relationships will be right, so it should still work. You may need to bring in some, I suppose partly for my own satisfaction, bring in some a bit more yellow into the hue in places. There's a little bit of detail up here, which is pretty much the half tone color. Now when I, if, when I come to do, once I've got the colors kind of banged in, if you like, I'll do a little bit more uh, kind of modeling and blending. And most of it will be between the light and the half tones. That's where most of the subtlety is, I find. So now I'm gonna get my light brush. I'm gonna put in this really high chroma chroma 16 center light so so far on here i've got my core shadow modeling factor i've got my reflected light and i've got my half tones now i'm going to go ahead and put in this this 
center night or form night as people sometimes call it this is where the chroma is highest because it's where the most light is falling on the object in this case on the clementine um, and when you're excuse me sorry it's so hard to paint and talk at the same time when you're when you're checking your colors it's very important to make sure of two things when you're angling your panel when you're using your checker firstly that you can hit the, the value of the lightest lights over here on the panel and secondly that you can hit the highest chroma and i find generally the highest chroma that you can see on your object that you're painting and i find generally that i need to make sure that i can hit the chroma of the center light and if i can't hit that chroma then it's probably because i don't have enough my, because my tag is angled too far away from the light my panel is angled too far away from the light and i can't match it So if I then angle the panel slightly more towards the light, then I can hit the crown. So that's the center light in. It is more orangey than the clementine itself. Um, the hue is more towards red, so I may bring in a little bit of this or yellow one too. But for the moment, I, I just want to show you how this looks done really, really simply. And here's where my highlight will be. I am going to need to put in a little bit of white. Now, what I've got here is I've got titanium white and flake white. And the reason I've got both is I generally use both because... I use titanium white most of the time um, unless I uh, want high chroma in mixes um, that are towards the yellow and orange end of the spectrum because titanium white is a kind of a bluish white and drops chroma um, when you put it into yellows and oranges and titanium white is more yellowish and doesn't. So I'll just put a little bit of that in because it does go right up to white, to very nearly white. So although I've done very little there, and it's really simple, if you kind of, if you blur your eyes, which I, I always have my eyes out of focus when I'm painting, especially in the early stages, you've got something that's already starting to um, give a suggestion of form. The main thing that needs to happen with this at the moment to make it look more realistic is more of a transition between um, the shadow area here across the half tones to the light between the between these half tone areas and these half tone areas here and i can do that <clears throat> by mixing between these just because i've got these colors out and ready mixed doesn't mean i'm obviously in the real world <clears throat> there's a lot of variation between them um, they don't end on hard delineations like this so I'm mixing between them to get a kind of a I suppose a kind of a half tone between the center light and the half tone and then once I've got that in I can start to look at where I need to make some adjustments to make the form live a little more I'm going to bring a little bit more The, more, the yellow hue into the light here. I'm 
but I tend not to not to do much modeling at all in the in the sense and I I I, I don't want to mess with it too much, largely because I need to keep that chroma really high if the colour is going to work. If I want that to sing out and really to live, then I'm gonna to have to keep the chroma high. And if I diddle about with it too much and try and add too much detail, there's always a danger that I'll lose too much chroma. So now I'm at the point where most of it is, is pretty much in. Um, and I'm starting to think about to look at the Clementine itself and to think about where I might need to make some adjustments where I've got things a bit out. I'm bringing in a bit of that yellow hue from the cube again into the into the core shadow because I can see it there. I find hue. I used to say categorically all the time um, on objects of a single local, the hue never changes across the form. And actually, I found the more that I've worked with it, that it's not entirely true. Not in all cases. A lot depends on the light. And it depends on what you're painting. And there are times when the hue does change. And I've noticed lately when I've been painting in natural light, that the shadows are often slightly, slightly warmer. Um, now that's probably because lately I've been painting uh, under light, which is non-direct daylight with blue skies. So the light is quite cool. And the ambient light in the room is um, is warmer. And I suspect that a little bit of that gets into the shadows and that may be why. So I'm really making quite small adjustments at this point. Not really doing very much. I'm just looking for obvious differences between what I've got here. Um, and what's on the subject? I'm just going to clarify this line around here a little bit. And there's a little that little bit at the top of the clementine which is it's mostly it looks like it's a greenish color but it's actually it's mostly neutral um, so I'm going to use I'm going to paint it on with almost entirely neutral there's only a tiny little bit of it really that you can see So I could pretty much leave that like that if I wanted to be painting blocky or, or loose. Um, if I wanted to refine it a little bit further, there's usually um, the last stage for me on something like this is I'll get, uh, let me find a good brush to do it with. I'll get a very soft brush, dry. This is a very well-worn, Again, a mongoose filbert, a dry mongoose filbert, and really, really lightly just do a little bit of blending, but I don't like to do too much of this. I think I might want to. I'm 
might want to bring in a little bit more reflected light. I really don't want to overdo it. There's first, there's a bit of a darker shadow here. That goes a, a bit higher. comes a little bit further around here. Obviously everything that I'm putting on now, there's already a lot of paint on there, so it's mixing. So if I want to darken something, I need to put slightly darker. Then I, I want it to end up, because it's still mixed slightly with what's there. And I'm going to put in, I'm going to take a little bit of the, what was the half ton from the cube, mix it to lighten a little bit what I've got for the uh, for the reflected light and bring a little bit more in, hopefully without overdoing it. Going to stop there. Obviously, I could I could work longer, and if I was being not very disciplined as I used to be on these webinars, I, I would probably fiddle with that for some time to come. Um, but I don't want to do that um, because uh, the webinar will will just run over too far. So I'm going to stop this study there. I'm going to come back round, change cameras, and come back round to the front again. Good, you can see me again now. Um, so hopefully that's given you <clears throat> um, a quick idea of how judging those colours accurately in this very simple kind of way um, and painting really very simply like that, just with a, a small number of colours can perhaps surprisingly get you a reasonably decent result uh, of something that looks um, reasonably solid on the canvas. And I actually, for this painting here um, that I did, was it yesterday, yesterday or the day before, I think, I used exactly that method. Um, and actually they, they do look fairly similar, <clears throat> except obviously that this has a different background and it has some other objects in it. Let me, I'll just see if I can, um, see if I can bring up a slide of that actually, so you can, you can see it better. Let's see if we can do that. It worked last time, so I'll attempt it and try it again. Let's see if that comes up. Yes, good. Well, it appears to be working for me. Um, now, that, because this is so high chroma, the, the camera actually struggles a little bit with taking pictures of this, but hopefully you can see in this one as well, and because this is quite a close-up of it, the modeling factors are there, the same modeling factors are there. There's the core shadow. There's some reflected light in the shadow, half tones, the center light, um, and then the highlight uh, and the odd little bit of detail. Um, obviously there's some other bits. There's the, the segment and a bit of the peel as well, but I actually used the same method um, of, with the color checker um, to find the colors for those, especially for the lighter parts of the peel. Um, it was a slightly different hue. Um, but it gave me the values that I needed. So this little painting, uh, and the, the same actually I should, I should mention as well for the, the uh, board that they're sitting on. So this little painting was painted um, in exactly the same way um, as I just painted this little study here. And they actually do look fairly similar and it is actually the same Clementine, although obviously I spent a little bit longer. This painting I think took me about six hours and funny enough was supposed to be a demonstration painting. Um, but I actually forgot to switch the camera on when I was doing it. So I didn't manage to, uh, I didn't manage to get a recording of that one. Um, but not to worry, we can always do it again. Um, so I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I would, it would really help me uh, if you can tell me in the chat, if you 
if that firstly if that surprises you if you actually thought that that clementine looked fairly solid and looked fairly round um even with just that very limited amount of painting and those just few colors do you think that that um looked okay do you think that it, it looked real or do you think it's it's um did it leave you thinking well that's I, d I don't really think that that worked that well i don't really think that that looked solid and had form if you can just pop in the chat for me um just say yes it looked three-dimensional if you thought it looked real um or no it didn't if you didn't think it looked too if you didn't think that the the form turned too much generally people thought it came out okay um so i'm also really curious to hear if you were quite surprised whether you can that you can paint something that looks reasonably three-dimensional like that with just that small amount of colors did that surprise you that you could do it that simply <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's slightly awkward with these webinars because there's a there's about a five to ten second delay me saying something and then it actually uh, it coming out to you so generally generally speaking oh someone thought it didn't look real at all <laughs> that's good <laughs> i like the honesty generally generally speaking people thought that it was okay um so uh hopefully that's it's managed to um sorry i just lost my mic if you haven't come across that kind of method of, of um, judging colors accurately and especially if you find color difficult um i think working with a method like this uh, uh certainly not for your entire artistic career um but if you want to um learn a little bit more about color uh, and you're struggling with color at the moment i'm doing some very simple studies like this with spheres like this one behind me this blue sphere here or with a sphere like this one which is slightly lower chroma lower chroma ones are easy uh, to paint and then moving on to real world objects like this i think it can give you a way because you get color more right more often um, i think it, it allows you to see what color really should be um, and it allows you to find out what you can do with your tube paints um, and whilst there are no shortcuts um, it can get you to a point where you understand color better more quickly because you spend less time um, basically just just thrashing around um, and, 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 and guessing uh, which is what I did for a very long time before I started working with this kind of method um, so I think probably uh, oh, is, have we got a bit of a problem with the mic Sorry, we we'll always have a few little technical problems with this. Is that better? Fix the mic. <laughs> Is the mic better now? We appear to have a few mic, a few mic problems at the moment. Still static on the mic. Can you hear what I'm saying? Mm, buzzing and cracking on the mic, sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm going to try something. I've got an extension read on the mic. I'm going to disappear sound wise for a moment and then I should come back. Am I still here? Am I back? Hopefully that should be better. Is this any better now with the mic? Still bad. <laughs> it's the shirt mic. Yes, I know. I know I've got it. I've got it set up as well as I can. Unfortunately, it does seem to be. Not yet, not better yet. Have another go. Okay, I'm afraid that's going to be, I think, about the best that I can do with the mic at the moment. Can you still hear what I'm saying, though? No? 
can understand me, but it's not take off your shirt. Actually, I'm really not going to do that because you get to see all the scars that I've got from the, the operation that I had. I'm going to take it off the shirt. How's that? Is that better? Move and I can turn it so it's up there. Yes, I think it is just a bad connection on the mic. Unfortunately, it is. it's very difficult for me to... All I can do is jiggle a connection and try and improve it. Mm. Okay, I'm going to try one more thing with the mic. Hang on two seconds. I know there was no sound at all there for a minute. <laughs> no sound. There should be at least sound now. I'm sorry if there's a bit of static, but there's a... Sack the sound engineer. Yeah, okay. It looks like <laughs> finally we've got it working again. Okay, that's brilliant news. Um, so, okay, so we, we, we can... Finally, we can get to the Q&A bit now. So um, if you just, I'm just going to hold this here like this, just in case I don't want to mess around with it. So if you've got any questions about any of that, um, uh, feel free to ask them now. Um, there was one question um, about the lighting. Um, now, what I use, as I say, I'll, I'll send you out an email um, with links to the lighting that I use. I use very powerful four um, daylight bulbs with a high CRI. Um, and a, a high color temperature, very cool color temperature, and they're in a, a large soft box, um, which um, diffuses um, the light source. And I'll send out some links for that. Um, can you make your own chips? Yes, you can. Um, <clears throat> what I would advise you to do if you want to try out some of this stuff is to get hold of um, the Munster Student Book, uh, which has uh, it has less tags in. Um, than this big Munsell book that I've been using for this demonstration. But you can still do an awful lot with it. I worked with that for about two years. And the reason it's it's so useful to have the actual Munsell tags, although you can do it just with a piece of acetate and you know mix your colors and put them on and do it that way, it shows you stuff about color. So it shows you when the hue changes. It shows you how much the value changes by. Um, and it allows you to see the relationships between the colors. So that's um, really useful. The Munsell Big Book, um, I would just put in, uh, go to Google and put in Munsell Color Atlas. And I think you can get it from a company called x -Rite. Um, And they also have it on Munsell.com. You'll be able to see it there. It's about $1,000. Uh, it's really expensive. Um, so yes, that is uh, a very expensive way to get started with this stuff. But what you can do, um, as I say, is get hold of the Munsell Student Book and you can sometimes get secondhand ones. Um, but make sure um, that if you... Uh, get one of the second-hand ones um, that you contact the seller first to make sure um, that you've got all, that all of the chips are there. 
Um, can the color checking method be used to paint from photos? Absolutely. Um, but uh, in that case, if, you, if you're painting from photos, you can just, and there's no reason why you shouldn't have two prints of the photo and just dab the paint directly on the photo. I mean, it's, it's really very easy if you're doing it that way. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that I haven't yet seen a camera that doesn't affect color and value in some way when you take a photo. So I would strongly advise that you do these kind of studies from life because you will learn more there. Uh, using oils, yes, I'm using oils. Um, certainly, it would translate perfectly well to acrylics, um, although acrylics do tend to change value a little as they dry. But certainly, yes, you can do it with acrylics too. I can't see any reason why you couldn't. Um, someone's saying the student's book is, is not very good because the tags are too small. Yes, they are small and they're matte as well, so it's nowhere near as useful as the big book, but it's much cheaper. Um, and most of the basic stuff that I learned, I learned with the student book. Uh, yes, I paint the, the, the cubes and the spheres, these things. This is just uh, foam polystyrene, you know. And I paint it first with acrylic gesso, um, which isn't gesso, of course. It's just acrylic primer. Um, and then I uh, paint it with oil paints, yes. And that's very useful because when you're looking at the colours across a modelling factor of something like this and you know what the exact local is, um, it really helps you to again to see the relationships between the color and the colors and it, it you you learn more about color that way rather than just painting things exactly as you see am i going to do a month color course actually that's a really good question because that's the next thing that i want to get onto now just quickly um here actually I haven't overrun too much this time i'm amazed um but yes i do i have just launched today in fact um i, I just opened it up earlier on today for enrollment a course um, in which I'm teaching all of this stuff from the basics with value, uh, matching the Munsell value scale, um, to going through studies with cubes like this, color checking. Um, unfortunately, with webinars like this and with blog posts, there's only so much information I can get across. And um, the color course is, um, it's an eight week course. Um, and it's, a, a, it's um, very focused on doing. It's a really practical course. It's not like you get a bunch of videos with me talking about Munsell. There's a series of assignments um in terms of commitment it re will require a certain amount of commitment to do probably at least around an hour a day um five days a week to start with um it's in four two uh, two week modules uh, it's 199 dollars to do um <clears throat> uh, and there is a free trial which shows some of the first videos um but only uh, just the first bits um you absolutely will need the monster book to do it um if you want to find out some more about it now i'm gonna have to I'm going to risk the mic now, okay? I'm going to stick it back on. Hopefully, it's just the connection thing, and that's still working, okay? Um, let me just put put in here. Since you're on the webinar now. Putting a link to the to a page which will which will into the chat, which will tell you um, some more about the course. And as I say, it's a, it's an eight week course. There's two weeks at the beginning while you get your materials together. You need to have a set up something like this. Um, so there's a fair bit of stuff you need to get together. Um, uh, but it's it's quite an intensive course that focuses just on color. So how to mix colors like this cleanly and how to mix them efficiently how to model form like this with color. And it, you go through doing cubes in values and spheres in values onto cubes and spheres in color. And by the end of the eight weeks, and we got into doing actual still life paintings, um, like this kind of thing up here. Um, so by the end of the course, the outcome for you should be the firstly one that you understand color much better. Um, and two that you can see in the work that you do. So you'll do a, a still life of say an apple and a lemon or something like that, a couple of pears, a couple of pieces of fruit. Um, and you will be able to paint more beautifully then and paint with more realistic color. Um, now, for the people who are on the webinar now, what I'm also doing is if you um, sign up for the course in the next 24 hours, um, so let's say what time is it? Let's say by 12 o'clock my time, I'm going to have to work out what that is in Pacific Eastern time or <laughs> Belgium or wherever you happen to be. But if you sign up by um, 12 a.m. Uh, UK time tomorrow, then I'll also um, give you a free one-to-one uh, -one private Skype call as part of the course, which you can take at any part of the course. Um, actually, you know what? I'll do two 
because it would probably be really useful to have two, one part of the way through and one at the end. And as part of the Skype call at the end, um, which would be a private call just between the two of us where um, I'll be able to see your, your work and, and give you uh, instant feedback on it. I'll also give you a practice plan um, for what I think will help you um, go further um, and understand color better. Um, it's in it's dollars. It's one hundred and ninety nine dollars to sign up for the course, and that's for the eight week course. There's also a, a private Facebook group um, where you can upload your um, assignments, and um, you will get feedback uh, on what you've done. Um, so have a look at the at the course if you fancy checking that out. It's an online course. It's not a physical course. Um, uh, so uh, it's uh, taught through videos and a series of assignments um, and then uh, uploading um, the work you do to the Facebook group and getting feedback there. And of course, as I say, I'll give you, um, if you sign up within the next 24 hours since you uh, are part of the webinar audience, um, uh, I'll also give you two one-hour Skype calls as part of the course. So have a look, check it out. Um, I'll send out an email uh, in an hour or so um, with a link to the replay of the webinar and also a link to the course and some other links for some hopefully some useful stuff. Can you do the course with a monthly student? Well, you can do it with a student book. Um, I, I couldn't do a course that required people to to spend a thousand dollars on the on the big book. That would be a little bit too expensive, I think, for people. But you can, you will need the student book. But yes, you can do it with the student book. Um, would I think of doing a physical course one day? Yes, absolutely. I think I would um, at some point, uh, hopefully before too long. Um, Yes, uh, there is a video available and I'll send you, it's going to be on YouTube. This is a Google Hangout, so it'll be recorded as a um, uh, a YouTube video and I'll email you out the link so you can watch it as many times as you like. Um, any last questions now before I go? Can you have access to the, oh yes, you get, someone's asking, can I have access to the course materials afterwards? Yes, um, you get lifetime access to the course materials. I would advise if you possibly can, um, to do the course in the pace that it is, um, because you will be able to get feedback from other people who are at the same stage of the course as you, but there's no requirement to do that. Once you've paid for the course, and um, what happens is each module becomes available in two week batches. Um, so when you first sign up, you get the first two weeks, and then you get the next two weeks, two weeks later. This is to stop people rushing through to the end. Um, uh, but yeah, you've got basically lifetime access to the course, so you can do it at your own, uh, your own pace if you like. Do you need Facebook? Um, it will help, um, uh, but mostly because you'll be able to get feedback from other members of the course too. But no, you don't need Facebook. You can do all of the feedback over email if you don't like Facebook, and I quite understand if you don't. <laughs> You're very welcome, everybody. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. I think part of the problem that I had with the, the webinars before and Part of the reason I got so ill was because I used to stay up so late. It's already well past my uh, my bedtime. Oh, last question about the course. When does it start? Um, it starts as soon as you enroll. So it basically starts um, tomorrow. If you enroll tomorrow, it starts tomorrow. Um, but you have two weeks um, of getting your materials and your setup together uh, and doing just the first assignment, which is a very simple one, um, before um, the, co the course really starts in earnest in two weeks' time, so I think that's about the 8th of September, something like that. Okay, thanks very much for coming. I hope you learned something. Um, I hope it was enjoyable, and I hope I'll see you again for another webinar. Thanks very much. Good night.